So as you read through your bulletin today, you can obviously see that we just tried to mix stuff up a little bit, service order a little differently and stuff like that. I also came to another realization this week, um, which I could use some clarification. So I'm going to tell you now. What our realization was is if you have a chronological Bible that we went through 10 years ago, it is chronologically different than the chronological Bibles that we ordered new. I'm not sure how the chronology of the Bible changes in 10 years, but apparently it has. So I am using the old chronological Bible. So when I tell you a page or something along those lines, if you have a new Bible, it's not going to line up probably. So I did look it up. Just so you know, if you have an old one, there's actually a glossary in the front that tells you the daily reading. If you have a new one, your glossary is in the back of the Bible. So if you have an old Bible, we should be on page 17. If you have a new Bible, you're on page 71 this week. Um, We're going to be reading out of the book of Job, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Or if you have a regular Bible, you can turn to Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The word of the Lord says this. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer once again? Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, as we read about Job, the words are all too strong in our minds. Heavenly Father, our hearts break for the Force family. The pain, the tragedy that they've had to endure is almost too much to bear. And yet they're not the first to experience this pain and tragedy, and they certainly won't be the last. God, as we read through the words of your scripture today, and we read about your servant, Job, I cannot think of a more timely time message to read and a time to read it. Job's response in this passage is seemingly incredible, so may our response mirror his. But God, it's not easy, so we ask that you would work through the pages of your scripture, that your Holy Spirit would dwell within us and amongst us today, and that your spirit would fill this building for your glory and for your power and for your kingdom. God, you ordain all things in your time. We can say that your timing is perfect, but it certainly never feels or rarely feels perfect in our lives, especially during times of heartache and trouble. So God, work in a way today that only you can in our lives. Work in a way today that only you can in our midst to draw us close to you that we may feel your presence, that we may feel your spirit, that we may feel your comfort and your peace. May we know that we are yours. May we live in that truth today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes God works in in crazy ways. So I think we all know this or at least acknowledge it. And uh, I want to let you know that the scripture reference was actually picked out (laughs) a week and a half ago, 
because when I read my chronological Bible the first time, I thought I had seven days to preach on last Sunday, and then I, on Friday I realized, no, there's only two days in the new year, and I picked from day five on my reading. Before preparing last week's message, so I'm like, well, I'm just going to transfer that to the next week, and the songs I had picked out were picked out then. Um, They had nothing to do with yesterday. And sometimes God just works like that. And I, I'm sure you all know or have heard, if you don't, Ernie Force passed away last night. And uh, it's just tough. It's just tough. And so as we were driving home from the hospital, as, you know, we're lying in bed um, this morning, early in the morning in my office, I'm like, you know, what would Ernie want me to say? What should I talk about? And it became very simple very quickly. Ernie's about Jesus. Ernie Force is about Jesus Christ. If there's anything Ernie wants me to talk about today, it's Jesus. If you think about Ernie, he was about Jesus in every aspect of his life. He was unashamed about it, and he was unabashed about it. So what does Ernie want me to state? And this is not part of the, this is the part that I didn't plan until this morning. That Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, and he lived a human existence. That he was tortured, crucified, and died on the cross. That Jesus rose from the grave on the third day and defeated death. That he ascended to heaven and now sits at the right hand of God the Father. That his death and his resurrection and his ascension made a way for us to be made right with, Christ, with God the Father. That salvation lies by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We remember Ernie. We remember the incredible impact that his life had on many of ours. With every breath, with the tears, and through the memories, the stories shared... I'll remember the constant thought of that little man who had a bigger heart than anybody I knew. And we'll celebrate him in his homecoming. And I think we all understand that when we cry, we're not crying for him. We're just mourning our loss. Because that man is celebrating right now. Ernie truly believed what Paul wrote to the church in Rome found in Romans 8 28 that all things work for good that all things God works for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to his purpose that was his favorite verse I should say that is his favorite verse but another passage that I keep returning to in my mind can be found in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly we are wasting away yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So I want to make it clear <laughs> that none of this, aside from what I just talked about, was based upon Ernie's passing. But it will be inspired by it. Do you remember, this is where my sermon actually starts. And forgive me, I've already warned Corey, like, I'm just not looking over there. Monica, I'm not looking over there this morning, right? Do you remember what you were doing on Saturday night, October 23rd, 1993? Some of you weren't around. Some of you were just a glimmer in your parents' eyes. October 23rd, 1993, because I remember what I was doing that night. Very clearly, I remember what I was doing that night. It was game six of the World Series being played in Toronto, Canada between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Toronto Blue Jays. Toronto was up three games to two. But I knew what was going to happen that night. I was a Phillies fan. And there were two very different teams in the World Series that year. The Toronto Blue Jays, the defending champions, they had all the superstars and the glitz and the glamour. And then you had the Philadelphia Phillies. A bunch of misfits who all happened to have a career year at the same year. Like, they were gritty, they were gutsy, they were ugly, they were full of mullets, and they were full of tobacco, right? Like, they just did their thing. And the stories from that season would bear that out. But I knew 
since the Blue Jays were up three games and one, and the Phillies won game five, that they were going to win game six and force a game seven, and I knew they were going to win a game seven. And they won game five, so game six was a foregone conclusion. The Blue Jays jumped up, and the Jays were up to the sixth inning, but I still knew that the Phillies were going to win, and it was in the sixth inning that the Phillies scored a bunch of runs to go up six to five. And I knew that the Phillies were going to win. I knew it was going to be ugly. I knew they were going to flirt with disaster. I knew it was going to be crazy, and the roller coaster ride was going to keep me on the edge of my seat. But I knew that the Phillies were going to win until they didn't. Until Joe Carter took a 2 2 low inside fastball over the left field fence. And, and I remember sitting there watching that game in my youth leader's basement, just completely in disbelief. I knew what was going to happen, and yet that's not what came to fruition. So when you know that something's going to happen, if something's going to play out a certain way in your life, and then it doesn't play out that way, how are you supposed to react to it? Life's kind of like that, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't always go to script. We can't all be the James Bond, right? Did you ever watch a James Bond movie? The man gets every right break possible known to humankind. Every movie, he should be dead 100 times over, and every movie, he's not. In every movie, he gets the girl, and he wins the case, and he does the thing. I want to be the James Bond. Unfortunately, I'm oftentimes the Clark Griswold. If you're not sure who that is, any of the vacation movies, the dad. That more defines my reality. How's Job's life going in this passage? I mean, he was living up to this point what we would call the good life. Material comfort, financial stability, and not just stability, but sustainability. He had land, he had crops, he had a family, a flourishing family. He was emotionally grounded, and we know that he was rock solid in his faith. And it is at that point that the complete bottom of his world drops out. So I want to make sure that I'm setting the stage for what we gather here today. I'm not going to read it if you get sick or if you're bored or if you just need to brainwash or whatever. You can go back and read verses 13 through 19 of chapter 1. I'm not going to read over it. But when we meet up with Job today, he has already experienced significant loss in his life. He has figuratively passed the first test, excuse me, that Satan has laid out for him. But Satan goes back to God and Satan basically says this. Look, yeah, Job passed the first test. When I heard his life outside of himself. However, Job will not pass the second test if you allow me to afflict his life personally, his life physically, his life internally and emotionally, but more than anything, just his physical body. When he gets physically harmed, then he will deny you. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but the first video we watched this morning was a song called The Motions by Matthew West. And, and it was a video about uh, uh, basically something he went through in his life, where he's a musician. I'm not a musician, so I can't relate totally. But what I know is that if you're a musician, your voice is very important to you, if you're a singer especially. He went through a procedure. We had to have surgery on his throat. And it really was a 50-50 bet. He went into surgery knowing that there was a 50-50 chance that when he came out of surgery, he would never be able to sing again. Can you imagine the apprehension? The trepidation that that would cause, that's what that video was about. But I don't know if you read, you probably didn't have time, it went through pretty quick. At the bottom of the screen, at the beginning, when he had that write-up on the situation, it ended with this. He said, God is at work even in our weakest moments, and this is where change begins. You see, God often works in our hearts and our lives in ways that we cannot understand. And beyond a shadow of doubt, they're almost always in ways that we would not have chosen for ourselves. I remember back my senior year in high school, I was in the weightlifting club. It was, uh, it was a club, the club period was Fridays at lunchtime. And so, so I had, my schedule went like this. I had weightlifting club, I think it was like 45 or 50 minutes, and then I had like a half an hour of lunch, and then we went back to my English class. And it was towards the end of the year, I think it was in the spring, and one of my friends was a pretty well-built guy. I myself was not. And I said to him, I said, look, I think your biceps are cool. Like, I'm jealous of your biceps. Can I do a bicep workout with you sometime? He goes, sure. So next Friday, there's about 15 minutes left in weightlifting club. He goes, Scott, come on over here. And, and we had this bar. It was a curl bar. If you've ever seen a curl bar, it's about that long. It's got little twisty things in the middle. And he put like a 25 and a 5 on each side. So I think that puts up to like 65, 70, 80, 75 pounds, something like that. He goes, I'm going to do some repetitions. Then I hand you the bar, and you do the same thing I do. And then you hand the bar back to me. I said, okay. So he pulls the bar up and he does 10 curls. 
He hands me the bar, and I do 10 curls. So I hand him back the bar, and then he does nine curls. I go, okay, I can see where this is going. Now, it wasn't a ton of weight. I was probably stronger back then than I am now. But it was enough where when you get to the end, you go, wow, this is starting to hurt a little bit. And with each set, the number goes down, so does your rest time, right? And, and five doesn't sound like much, and if I just did five fresh curls, I could pop them right out. When you get to five, you get to the fourth one, you're like, oof, right? And when you get to one, you're really starting to struggle a little bit. That's 55 repetitions in a short amount of time. So we went 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And, and I did the one, and I went to go put the bar back down. He goes, hey, Scott, bring that back over here. I said, why? He goes, hand it to me. So I handed it to him. Guess what he did? Two. I'm like, wait a second. He goes, well, we went down. Now we got to go back up. I wasn't prepared for that, guys. I understood why his biceps looked the way they did. See, here's the thing. I went to lunch. It hurt to lift the food to my mouth. What was worse is I had an English test following that. I literally went up to my teacher apologizing, telling her, I don't know what I can do, but if you can't read my writing, my arms are literally spaghetti noodles. I can't write right now. So do your best, and if you've got any questions, please ask me, because I really don't want to fail this exam. How do you think I felt four or five days later, after my arms had time to rest, recover, rebuild? You see, that's how muscles are built, right? You, you break it down, and it's in that rest and recovery time where they build back stronger and bigger. Now, I could choose not to do that bicep workout. I could choose not to lift weights. And if I do nothing, then nothing's going to happen. In fact, if you do nothing, then your muscles will probably go in the opposite direction. They will probably atrophy. It's the breaking down of a muscle and the rebuilding that makes it stronger. Conversely, the same thing is true in our faith, isn't it? I mean, what happens when you walk through the valleys of life? Do you emerge from those valleys closer to God or further away from Him? I mean, you'll, you'll see by the time we're done with this service, there's a common thread in all the music videos that we're going to be watching this morning. There are songs about difficulty. There are songs about hardship. There are songs about things that we normally wouldn't choose for ourselves in life things that we often try to avoid. And in the last song we listened to, Shoulders by King and Country, there's a line in it that says, your forgiveness is my fortress, your mercy is relentless, my help comes from you, God. Do you know this to be true in your life? Job did. Job knew this to be true. Job stood upon that promise in the face of unimaginable pain. Pain that we can't even fathom. Are we inclined to do the same in our lives? I mean, are we wired to run to God in the midst of hardship? Does our help truly come from God? It's easy to say the words, especially sitting in a church service on a Sunday morning or watching online. It's easy to say it, but does our help truly come from God? There's two practical points I want to bring about in the message this morning that deal with Job's situation. The first is simply this, and maybe you'll think this is a little bit weird, and maybe it is a little bit weird, but I've heard it often, in my, often enough in my life that I feel the need to address it in a message like this. We cannot compare pains in our lives. We cannot compare pains in our lives. We all experience loss and suffering in our lives to varying degrees. You know, there, an example I'll use is there was, a, there was a youth leader from our previous church. And as I got to know this woman, I realized how amazing of a person she was. And the reason I say that is because she was in church in the first place after going through what she went through. Uh, the closest thing I can uh, compare it to is if you were here a couple years ago when Jason Pipkin preached and he gave his testimony. This woman had been through every negative experience that I could even imagine. And I mean that. Every possible negative experience that I could imagine from drug and alcohol abuse to physical abuse and emotional abuse to sexual abuse to pain and suffering to death, which concealed her or which led to a deep downward spiral in the abuses in her lives. And it just kept continually spiraling down. All this by the time she was even old enough to vote. 
I, I'm telling you, I've never heard anything like it. And if you were to make a movie, a Hollywood movie about her life, you would go, well, nobody could possibly go through that much stuff. It was almost unimaginable. And what's the tendency when you hear something like that? Because I've heard many of you say this before, or many not you specifically, but people in general, we tend to hear something like that and say, wow, my life is so easy compared to that person's. I should probably just keep my mouth shut. I can't compare to what they're going through. It may put it in perspective a little bit, right? It should put it in perspective. But somebody else's pain, somebody else's loss, somebody else's suffering doesn't negate or marginalize yours. The fact that that woman was in church following Jesus at all was inspiration enough for me. And we all experience pain and suffering in our lives. Guys, I'm pretty sure none of us are ever going to measure up to the pain and suffering that Job experienced. If you weren't bored enough to read back through chapter 1 yet, I'll give you a brief synopsis. He's sitting around doing his thing during the day. One of his servants runs up to him and says, Hey, a band of raiders has come out of the hill country, and they've taken all of your oxen and all of your donkeys. That's 500 oxen, 500 donkeys. They ran away with them. They killed all your servants except for me. I'm the only one who survived. And before he was done talking, another servant comes up to him running out of breath. And he says, hey, just so you know, we were out there with the sheep, and fire fell from the sky, killed all the sheep and all the servants that were tending to the sheep. I'm the only one who survived. As if that's not enough, while he's almost done talking, another servant comes running up, right? A group of raiders has come out of the mountains and stole all of your camels, 3,000 of them, and killed all the servants who were watching over the flock of camels, aside from me. I'm the only one who survived. And while he's still talking, are you with me here? Another servant comes running up and says, hey, I was at your oldest son's house. All your children were there, seven, seven boys, ten girls. They were feasting. They were having this great feast. It was a party. It was a great time. And, and then this incredible wind came through. And this wind completely destroyed the building, knocking over everything and killing everybody inside, not only including your sons and your daughters, but all the servants except for me. I am the only one who survived. That's what Job went through in chapter 1 when Satan says, well, that wasn't enough. You've got to let me afflict him physically. I'm guessing that we'll probably never go through that. That seems a bit extreme. And if anybody in here has got 7,000 camels or 7,000 sheep, you know, that's cool too. But we're not done, are we? Because what did we read through in today's scriptures? Job was afflicted with painful sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And if you read throughout the book of Job, if you read all the scriptures and you put it together, that sounds like one thing, but here's how it actually plays itself out. This is what it actually meant in Job's life. He had nightmares because of the physical pain afflicted upon his body. He had scabs that peeled and became black. He had disfigurement and a revolting appearance. He had bad breath. He had excessive thinness. He had a fever and pain both night and day. Now, does that sound pleasant? It's a little different than painful sores from the bottom of the sheet to the top of his head. His appearance was such that nobody would even come near him because he was so revolting. Why was it that way? It was that way for a purpose, because Satan intended it to be that way. Satan gave Job a pain that was intended to drive him away and get him to deny God. So it had to be extreme. Maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. My pain's not that bad. Guys, your pain doesn't have to measure up to Job's. We all have pain and affliction in our lives, and we will all, this should not be news to you, we will all experience more. It's not the question. The question I want to present to you today is what will you do with the pain when it comes? Because you do have a choice. Lou Gehrig had a choice. Maybe you read the Finding Faith column. At least I assume it was in the Finding Faith column yesterday. I didn't get to read the newspaper. But an article I wrote was supposed to be in it. And it was about Lou Gehrig. And what are the famous words that Lou Gehrig uttered? Many of you already know. Today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. 1939, Yankee Stadium in front of a huge crowd. That's what Lou Gehrig said. But do you ever think about the circumstances under which he said those words? Lou Gehrig was one of the greatest baseball players alive. He played on the best baseball team at the time. He, had set, he was called the Iron Horse for a reason because he never missed a game. 
2,130 straight games this man had started and played. A streak that took 56 years to be broken by Cal Ripken. From 1925 to 1939, this man did not miss one single baseball game until he was afflicted with this disease. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. What do we call it today? Lou Gehrig's disease. It's named after him. When he said those words, he knew for, a sure, for certainty that his baseball career was over. When he said those words, he knew pretty sure that those words or this disease would at some point claim his life. And yet, what did he say with resolve? Think about it. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. The response that he's giving doesn't seem to match the reality of the moment, does it? What was Job's response in similar circumstances? Shall we accept the good from God and not the trouble? Don't get me wrong. If you read through the book of Job, Job continues to, to, to ask questions of God. He gives God complaints, accusations, and appeals. But what he never does is he never turns his back on God. He never denies God. Job was hurting physically, emotionally, spiritually, but he never turns his back on God. Job doesn't understand the pain and suffering, but he never turns his back on God. Job asks repeatedly, why? What have I done to deserve this? Because I don't know, and I can't figure it out. But he never turns his back on God. Job was grieving bitterly from his heart and his soul. And out of this pain, what comes out? Shall we accept the good from not God but not the trouble? Job's suffering shouldn't make you feel the need to shut up and clam up and just be quiet and keep to yourself because your pain isn't as great as his. It should inspire you to draw closer to God because of it. Which brings me to my second point. And you've heard me say it already. You will experience pain in your life. It's inevitable. But you cannot prepare for the pain that you will experience. By drawing closer to God and seeking after him in all we do, we will learn to lean on him in both the good times and the bad. Look, some of the, some of the, some of the main characters of the Bible were overcome by grief at times in their lives. David. 2 Samuel chapter 18, it says, The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom. And I'm, I'm saying this loud because it's all exclamation points. So he wasn't saying it. He was wailing it. I'm not going to wail, but I'm going to say it loud. Oh, my son Absalom. My son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David was weeping bitterly over his son. But you know who Absalom was? Besides David's son? He was the son who betrayed his father. Absalom was the son who tried to take the kingdom from David. Absalom was the son who made him flee Jerusalem for fear of his very life, not knowing if he would ever be able to come back. Absalom was the son who figuratively stabbed his father in the back and probably literally would have had given the opportunity. And yet David's heart still grieved over his death. How about the account of Lazarus found in John, John chapter 11? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. It says Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus' heart was moved to tears of grief for Lazarus' friends and family at his death and the mourning that they were experiencing due to it. But grief and mourning gives way to God. And a spirit-directed understanding if we continue to remain faithful through the pain. And that's how we can find passages of hope in the midst of suffering. 2 Corinthians 5. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The Psalms are littered with them, so I can't go over all of them. But Psalm 16, I'm just going to read a phrase from each of these. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse, Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm chapter, 90, verse, chapter 91 says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
I love Revelation chapter 21 about the new Jerusalem. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the order of, the order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. It's the same perspective that Paul declared to the Philippians when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's an amazing perspective. But through it all, the question still remains, doesn't it? How do we achieve the faith of Job? How do we get to that point in our lives where we can truly utter the words that Job does in this passage? Chapter 1, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And today he says what? Shall we accept the good from God and not the trouble? How do we learn to live in such incredible faith? And the answer is actually found very early on in our passage today. It's found in verse 3. When God kind of serves Job up on a platter to Satan. He says, if you consider my servant Job, there is no one like him. On the, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Job is blameless and upright according to God. Why? Because he fears God. And shuns evil. You know, in this passage, when God states the words, my servant Job, it's easy to gloss right over that and not think about it. But this is actually a special designation to Job from God. In the Hebrew context, these words don't mean servant. What they mean is a close friend or a confidant. At other passages in the Hebrew scripture where these words, these same words are referenced, it is God referring to Moses or David or the prophet Isaiah. That's how God is referring to Job here. Someone I love, somebody I care about, somebody who is close to me. Job was not selected at random. He didn't draw the short straw here. In fact, he didn't draw any straw, really. Job was offered because of his fear of God and the avoidance of evil in his life. You know, Solomon writes repeatedly in the book of Proverbs this verse and verses that are very similar to it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. Fear of the Lord and a healthy avoidance of evil in our lives will similarly draw us, similarly draw us into right and close relationship with God. It will allow us to believe what we state when we say the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It will allow us to see with a perspective that is much larger than ours and is almost unrecognizable by the standards of the world in which we live. It will allow us to absorb, process, and accept that life with God will include trouble. And life with God will include heartache. But life with God will include joy and celebration so that ultimately and confidently we can state, may the name of the Lord be praised as Job did. What if we possess the faith of Job through the trials and heartaches in our lives? You know, the hardest part about asking that question is answering that question. Because the only way that you can answer that question is by walking through the figurative or literal valley of the shadow of death in your life. It's going through an experience that nobody ever wants to go through and nobody ever expects to go through, but an experience that every one of us will be all presented with at some point in our lives. It's having experiences that will leave scars on us. And we've all got scars. It's like the movie Jaws where they're sitting in the boat comparing scars, right? I've got scars. I got, I got one you can barely see. It's above my right eyebrow. It's actually mostly covered by my right eyebrow. When I was like five years old, I got bit by a German shepherd. I had to get stitches. It really wasn't that bad. The dog was playing, and I didn't know any better, right? I got one under my chin, which is why I keep chin hair. From when I was in college, playing volleyball, dove for a ball. They just waxed the gym floor. And the floor was sticky, so I didn't slide. I stuck, and my chin smacked the floor. Volleyball players do it fairly, from time, fairly often from time to time. Some of my players I've coached, I had three or four players in a season do it. Hardly hurts at all, but it bleeds like the Dickens, and you've got to stitch it up. My left knee is like uh, road construction. Like, I mean, there's arthroscopic holes all over. There's a little zipper patch right there. 
ACL, meniscus, MCL, all sorts of good stuff going on in there. My, my right toe and my big foot, most of you have never seen it or would have ever even noticed, and Laurie's laughing right now because it's an anomaly. When I was a kid, almost too young to remember, it's one of my earliest memories, I had some sort of tumor growing in there. So I got a scar, basically, where they had to cut through the nail all the way back. I had surgery where they cut it open and removed whatever it is. Now, my right toe, for most of my life, was like still exponentially bigger than my other toes. But what it did is it made my, my right toenail, like it's, it, it doesn't do this, it does this because of that scar going through it. You can still see the scar across my big toe. And my right toenail is nearly impervious to any toenail clippers known to mankind. Like I need to call a farrier basically when I cut my toe. You've got scars too. We all do. Our scars tell of events that happened to us in the past. Events that have shaped our lives. Events that have been part of defining who we are today. And every one of them are events that we have come through. What story do your spiritual and emotional scars tell about you? Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you asking your word to work a miracle in our lives. Asking you to be present in the midst of the hurt. Asking you to be present in the midst of the pain. And asking you to be present in the midst of the suffering. We want a faith like Job's. Every one of us would say we want a faith like Job's. What we don't want is have to go through the experience to get that faith. But God, the only way we can get that faith is by leaning on you during the good times and the bad. God, we don't want to go through it, but we desperately want to be closer to you. So give us the courage, the strength, the fortitude that can only come from you. Give us the peace and the presence that can only come from you. May your Holy Spirit reside in us. And for those of us who are grieving deeply last night and today, that pain is not going to go away soon enough. But you will remain faithful through that pain. So give us a perspective of second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year where we can see your faithfulness and experience you in a way that we never have before. God, may we not just be a people of talk, may we be a people of action for your glory and for your kingdom. May your will be done. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to read you now a story. A story I found that's, that's pretty powerful. And echoes really a lot of what I was trying to get across in this message. It's the story of Levi Christian Good. It says this, I looked over at the faint glow of my clock resting beside the bed. 2 a.m. How am I still awake? I slide my hands over my belly that, that still bears marks of him. Sometimes I can almost feel his little kicks inside of me. And I let my fingers imagine them again for a moment. October 29th was an ordinary Tuesday evening. My husband, Christian, and I ate bowls of ice cream as we shared sweet conversation about what was going to be. I held my belly as I always did, dreaming about the day that I would hold him. We were just four short days away from our son's due date, four days from what we knew would change our lives forever. We just didn't realize that on Tuesday evening, God had a very different story than what we expected on how it would come to be. That night, I went to bed with contractions, 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 they continued until the wee hours of the morning. By 3 a.m., Christian insisted we go to the hospital. We excitedly got dressed as I pushed through the contractions and smiled in between because this was it. We were finally going to meet our sweet Levi. It was pouring rain outside, but it only fueled the adrenaline, rush, ru the adrenaline rushing through us. It felt like a movie, and this was going to be our happy ending. Christian reached over the console, laid his hand over my belly, and said with anticipating eyes, It's happening, Laura. Can you believe it's happening? You're going to make the best, Mom. I love you. When we pulled into the hospital, a woman sat me in a wheelchair and pushed me into a delivery room. Two nurses appeared moments later with a heart monitor. They placed it on my belly, as my doctor had done numerous times before to hear the heartbeat. I looked over at Christian sitting in a chair across the room with a knowing smile, only a little while now. The nurses continued to slide the monitor over me for several minutes without hearing a heartbeat, and that's when I knew something was wrong. I looked over at Christian again, but this time with concern. He tried to assure me that everything was okay, as any loving husband would do, but he couldn't have known that it wasn't. After what felt like an eternity of searching, the nurses finally had an ultrasound machine brought into the room. 
The woman who operated the ultrasound could not tell us anything, and the screen was pointed away from us. It felt like torture. We looked at each other, both silently asking the same question. What is going on? When she walked out of the room, I told Christian, something is wrong, and I'm scared. He took my hand in his and gently tried to reassure me again, but I could see the truth in his eyes. He knew it, too. Finally, the doctor quietly came in with a sober expression that immediately confirmed our fears. Softly, he began, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. We cannot find a heartbeat. I'm going to give you both time, and then we are going to talk about how we go on from here. He walked out of the room, and when the door shut behind him, so did our world. In a moment, everything that we thought would be came crashing into the reality of what is. This baby boy that I had carried for nine months was no longer with us, and I could hardly breathe. Christian walked over to me, limply laying in the hospital bed with the remains of cold gel on my abdomen from trying to find a heartbeat, a heartbeat that was lost forever. We embraced tighter than ever before and cried intensely in each other's arms. The grief came knocking as grief always does, promptly, but uninvited. Can't look back there either. It crashed over us like cruel, merciless waves, unaware of the lives that they were drowning. When the doctor came back into the room, he was gentle and compassionate. He explained to us what he knew. Levi had grown full term. He doesn't understand what happened, but he is hoping when Levi is delivered, there will be some answers. He recommends starting an induction process, induction process since I am not dilated enough to get him there as soon as possible. We tried to nod in understanding of his words, but we couldn't possibly wrap our heads around them. And suddenly, the contractions were no longer an exciting challenge of what was to be, but a harsh reminder of our current reality. The hours following felt much like a nightmare. Christian called our parents and in between sobbing breaths, told them that their grandson was gone. He sent out messages to our close friends and family, begging for prayer. I will not sugarcoat this time. It was the hardest most painful moments of our entire life, and it's felt as though everything was broken. We did not think we would be able to go on. Our world was shattered. But this is when Jesus steps in, as he always does. Only in our brokenness can we witness healing. Something happened in that hospital room that was rather unexplainable in our present circumstances. Something that those of us who witness can never really leave unchanged. The Holy Spirit happened. A calm, inconceivable peace covered the room. Joy and sorrow that were once assumed enemies quickly became close companions. For sorrow gives joy its validity and ability to be trustworthy. Family began trickling in and praying over us. We prayed with them. We felt God's comforting hand like never before, and we knew that He hurt with us, but in a different way. He hurts for what we cannot see yet, while we hurt for all we can see now. For he, who, he too had to give up his only son, only he gave him willingly to save us. And this son, Jesus, who experienced every kind of suffering that we do, still had to ask God the question. For many of us in our questioning, it may be expressed this way. Is there any way I can experience your purpose without the pain. The induction process began as the Pitocin filled my body and we watched the etchings of lines making mountains across a contraction monitor. We began praising. We played worship music and let the words of hope overtake the disappointment. We read psalms aloud and replaced the fear with truth. Now before you think for a moment that we were so strong to have that kind of response in the face of this, know that it was only by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Christ in that moment. Our strength did not exist. It drowned with waves of grief that happened hours before. The only strength left was God's. And we witnessed its power that day. Early Thursday morning, the doctor broke my water and delivery of our son began. Suddenly, I felt so scared, so incapable. I requested to see my mom, and she quietly came in with a smile on her face. She put her comforting, reassuring hands on me and whispered, you are going to get through this because God will give you the strength to. We are all praying for you outside the door. When Christian came back in the room, I felt a new determination. I may be exhausted emotionally, mentally, and physically, but God is not. He is ready to carry me in this. 
and I'm only mo- and I am only moments away from seeing my son. Christian held my hand, kissed my forehead, and said, are you ready for this? To which I replied with a new sense of purpose, yes. By God's grace, our boy came quickly. And on October 31st, 2019, Levi Christian Good was born in body, though his spirit was already in heaven. All eight pounds and four precious ounces of him. When we saw him for the first time, we cried tears of joy and sorrow equally. All those kicks and hiccups and fist bumps in my belly were finally given a face. He was absolutely beautiful. We felt all the same feelings we imagine other parents experience when seeing their child for the first time. Overwhelming pride, joy, and completely undeserving of this gift. Only those feelings were joined by sadness too. Our family came in to meet their grandson and nephew, surrounding us with support. One by one, they hugged us and looked at him and expressed words we knew they were saying but did not have to. They felt it too. The most painful moment of the day was letting Levi go. We knew when the time was right, but it did not make it any easier to face. I cried bitterly as I held my son for the last time on this side of heaven. The postpartum room that I was transferred to was so quiet. The silence only reminded us of the baby cries we longed to hear and that we would never hear. And that is when it began. The letting go of dreams. Taking him in a walk in the stroller putting him in his crib at night, riding on the tractor with daddy, reading bedtime stories, teaching him how to ride a bike, watching him make friends, mama dancing with him at his wedding, together loving on his wife and witnessing him grow. Every vision that we had had over the past nine months floated away into the silence that now filled the room, ruthlessly empty of the life we had hoped for. When we left the hospital the following day, we stepped into our vehicle where an empty car seat and a full diaper bag lay. We wept. When we reached our road and slowly passed by the fields of our farm, realizing we would never get to show them to Levi, we cried again. We let the pain come. And every reminder of what would not be was laid at the feet of Jesus, followed by us desperately trying to, ha- trying to accept that this story he had for us, the story we, not, we, the story we would have not chosen. The days, weeks, and months that followed were incredibly hard. Since it is impossible to walk around this valley, we are forced to walk through it. Let me rephrase that. We are still walking through it. If there is one important piece that we have learned about grief in the light of being a believer who has hope in Christ, it is that there are moments of questioning that are followed by moments of trusting. And healing comes when we embrace them both. As Charles Spurgeon put it, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the rock of ages. Our days are numbered according to God's purpose. Though Levi's tiny feet never touched the earthly ground, he had a greater purpose for his days being so short, an eternal one. We are watching it play out every single day. He has changed us in our perspective. He has made us see God for the compassionate, merciful, and loving Father he is. Not in spite of the suffering, but because of it. For how it brings us to him, where we should have been all along. For how it teaches us to love our neighbors. And how it reminds us that this is not our home. Like it or not, every one of us will at some point in our lives be a part of a group we never imagined. God takes our ashes and our hurts and our journeys to intersect with others along life's road. Helping and walking alongside people we may have never met otherwise. And out of our experience, we have opportunities to make our mess our message. Treasures in darkness. That's what God does. He blesses us even in the dark and uses our pain for his purpose against all hope.